Good to be here with everyone. I know that Eve was with you last week and covered the first little section of this chapter eight that we're on. It's quite a meat, meaty <laughs> or juicy, uh, thick chapter with a lot of uh, good teaching in it. So we'll just kind of step through into the next phase of this chapter and the uh, section on patience, which is such an important practice in my life. So it's kind of um, serendipitous that I happen to get this hot potato in, in my lap here. It's not, you know, it's a warm potato, <laughs> but it is uh, really considered to be, patience is considered to be the antidote to anger. So anger can feel pretty hot. That can be a hot potato. So patience can cool us in certain ways. And we'll dive into that uh, after we practice. So let's go ahead and get comfortable and find a seat that you feel that you can restore yourself in at the end of a probably a long day. And that means either you're sitting in a comfortable position, either upright without support, or you can have the wall or a chair or cushion to support you. And, um, and, or you can lie down in the supine position. So uh, that is a valid position as well. We're going to do a slightly longer sit than normal. Every once in a while, I like to stretch us. Uh, that's okay, Karen, don't worry about it. <laughs> I like to stretch our capacity a little bit, you know, some really good advice uh, that Charlotte Choco Beck uh, gave in a little article that she wrote a long time ago that I think I shared in this class last year is to like once a week, you know, if you have a daily practice, once a week, sit for 10 or 15 minutes longer than you normally do and see what happens. So normally we do about a 30 minute sit. So we'll do about 40 minutes today. So again, you know, find find a seat that you feel that you can really release into and and rest in with as much stillness as possible. It's it's tempting to fidget, but just know that the more you fidget, the more the mind fidgets. So the stillness is actually quite important as you deepen and get more adept and comfortable with. Yeah, somebody's very excited about the six perfections here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm trying to post the the Donna stuff, but that's all right. No problem. Okay, so let's go ahead and close our eyes and we won't see the chats. <laughs> it's not a big deal. Um, we also won't see when people are fidgeting on the screen. <laughs> So allow your eyes to close. Um, oh, let's take a few deep, luxurious breaths and releasing any tension with the out breath and kind of winding up that we do throughout our day can then unwind with the out breath, feel each exhalation creating space, allowing you to unravel, unwind, release into the present moment. You feel tension in the skull, the scalp melting down into the earth. Muscles of the face, tension behind the eyes. The brow, the cheeks, the jaw, the throat, the neck, the base of the skull. Just feel any kind of tightness releasing with each out breath. The shoulders naturally draw down the back. The chest is a little buoyant, lifted as the shoulders release down. The chin slightly drawn in towards the center of the throat, elongating the back of the neck. And bring the tip of the tongue to rest against the upper palate, right behind the top front teeth.
Feel the breath fully inhabiting the chest as you breathe in, filling the lungs, expanding the front, back, and side body. Releasing with the out breath. The solar plexus, the abdomen, the side and the back body, filling with breath as you inhale, releasing as you exhale. Arms relaxed, the hands in the comfortable position, either on your lap or palms down on your thighs. Hips relaxed, sits bones rooted on your cushion or on the floor, and the legs in a comfortable position, the feet in a comfortable position, either crossed or parallel, as you wish. Feel the support of the floor and feel your body aligned with gravity. The inhale is an expansion, the exhale is a release, an inflation with the in-breath, a deflation with the out-breath. And feel a quality of relaxation wash over your whole body from the crown of the head down to the soles of the feet. And let that be infused with a feeling of spaciousness, spaciousness between the cells, between the atoms, between the tissues, between the organs, that you're pervaded by space. Space is all around you, and space is one of the primary qualities of consciousness, spaciousness, vast like the sky. Along with the quality of clarity, luminosity, consciousness, the quality of awareness illuminating that space. Feeling the rise and fall of the breath like the tides rising and falling in their own rhythm, natural breath like a sleeping baby, unforced, uncontrolled. Just let your awareness alight upon this natural, easeful flow of the in and the out breath, relaxing the abdomen, relaxing the brainstem helps to relax the feeling of the breath and the rhythm of the breath. So feel the jaw relax and feel that relaxation translate along the back, the base of the skull.
the lights upon the flow of the breath like a horse sitting on, like a rider sitting upon a horse, unified, like the horse and rider. Let the awareness ride the breath as it flows in and out. If something tries to pull you off the horse of the breath, just release it, let go, and surrender more deeply into the breath body sensation of the in-breath flowing in through the mouth or nose and out through the mouth or nose. If you can, breathe through the nose, but if you're congested or have certain issues, breathing through the mouth is fine. Beginning at the end of your next out breath, it's just a gentle counting of the breath from 1 to 21 as a way to create stability, concentration within this feeling of relaxation. Top of the in-breath, internally count 1, and so on.
Now releasing control of the breath, releasing counting of the breath. And let that release flood your awareness and nourish you, nourish your tissues, your cells, space in between. As you spend some time with the unification of awareness and the breath and practicing releasing distraction as soon as you notice it arising. A light touch, noticing, let it go and come back to the breath. Really do it, 100%. For the next phase of the practice. Use the quality of introspection, like posting a sentry at the gates of a fortress. Post your introspective faculty and notice when so-called invaders come, those thoughts of hopes and fears. Notice and say, no, thank you. Release and stay with the breath. Let the breath be the most fascinating thought, topic, feeling for you right now. Stay with it. Release distraction with the out-breath. Feel the flow of the in-breath. Stay, stay, stay. And the quality of mindfulness, the other faculty for shamatha. In addition to introspection, is about 85% of your awareness. Mindful blanket surrounding and permeating you. The quality of mindfulness pervades you, envelops you. And the introspection is just about 15% from time to time. How's it going? Am I lost in thought? Come back. Stay. Release and return to the breath.
you wish, I invite you to shift into an open-eyed meditative mode. If you feel comfortable doing that, if not, keep them closed. If you open the eyes, let them <clears throat> gaze at a comfortable angle towards the floor. And soften the gaze. Relax the muscles behind the eyes. Feel as if you were gazing into the mind itself, consciousness, within which all manner of appearances arise and pass. They seem so solid, but yet they're like a mirage, an echo, a castle in the sky. Or like a tracing of a design on water, dissolving immediately back into the space, instantly. Recognize that thoughts are just like that design on water, dissolving as soon as the image is traced. And when these thoughts, these distractions, these hopes and fears, anger, fear, sadness, fantasy, whatever it is, by releasing, releasing the clinging and the grasping onto thought, onto feeling, onto the sense of I, I am doing this, I am thinking that. totally pure and spacious state of mind appears. As you release the subtle grasping, the fuel behind the distracting thoughts, the spacious state, state of mind appears and the primordial great emptiness, free from concepts, dawns within you. Simple presence that dawns <clears throat> is the experience in which nothing is to be altered, fixed, lost, or gained, accepted, or rejected. It's called the purification of negative emotions in ultimate reality. The ultimate reality is that spacious, luminous, clear quality of mind. Rest in that. Stabilize yourself within that spacious, groundless ground.
From time to time, check your posture. Notice if the chin is jutting forward. Draw it back towards the center of the throat. Lengthen the back of the neck, the spine, the shoulders relaxed. The chest buoyant, the facial muscles relaxed, and so on. Refresh your awareness. And then open and release into spacious awareness.
brings you to check the thinking mind, the fixing mind, the doing mind. Let it subside like the tracing on the surface of the water. And remember, as long as you're doing it, doing meditation, you're not really meditating. So what do you do? Undo. Release. Unwind. The gross and subtle tensions, fixations, clingings. It's like falling back into the feather bed of the spacious sky-like nature of mind. completely lost the clarity of awareness, then start with the foundation again. Come back to the breath. Resting in the nature of mind, the breath becomes more shallow. You may feel a bit of your awareness in touch with it, but it's not the main central focus. Let the breath be natural. Shallow, let it be shallow. If it's deep, let it be deep.
for the last few minutes, just release everything, any subtle effort. Let the eyes do whatever they want. Release all effort and yet maintain this quality of awareness, wakefulness, but relax even more. And just let yourself be. Rest in non-meditation. Just be. Bring our session to a conscious close by, if you wish, bringing your hands together in prayer at your heart. Giving thanks to all those beings and circumstances that have brought you to this moment and this capacity to practice the earth, the air, the water family, the ancestors, teachers, mentors, each breath. You wish you're kind of bowing in gratitude, this internal humility of thank you, thank you, thank you. And we offer any positive energy that's come from this practice for the benefit of all beings everywhere, may it be of benefit. Come back together. I mean, we've always been together here, <laughs> but visually, if you want to open your eyes and turn on your camera, you can. If I didn't put you to sleep, I um, I might put you to sleep now. No, <laughs> the talk. In any case, um, I hope uh, the longer sit felt um, challenging in a good way for you or not challenging in a good way for you. But really, we're not looking for good or bad. We're just getting comfy with what is. <laughs> it's the main purpose of meditation, getting comfortable with what is. And especially, I mean, in all of the practices, really, but, you know, in that settling the mind in its natural state where we open the eyes and we just rest in spaciousness, it's not like we're not looking for energy over fatigue or even focus over distraction there's a quality of just being within the spacious awareness of whatever is arriving arising whether it's distraction or bliss or fatigue that can be very, very liberating i remember the first time i felt that when i was so struggling on a retreat i was so tired i was my head was nodding with fatigue and i was fighting it and wanted it to be different and then right at the right time the teacher Alan Wallace said, you know, you're not preferring 
any state over another. You just being present with what is in the moment, what is present here. And that helped me shift my struggle with the fatigue. And suddenly the fatigue wasn't a problem. It wasn't like it wasn't there, but it wasn't, um, didn't have me by the jugular and it wasn't, it, I wasn't suffering. I, I, the suffering dissolved around it. So that has a lot of profound implication for our daily life, for our family life, for our love life, for our work life, our sleeping, dreaming, and dying life, you know, we can develop that capacity to, to be with in an intimate way, right? Not in a non-attached, sterile way, but to also not be, not suffer as much, frankly. Yeah. Any questions, comments before we jump into the topic? Now is the time. Uh huh. Yeah. Annoyance with the length of meditation is a very familiar feeling. <laughs> okay. I, that was a direct message. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and then there was resting in the feather pillows of the duvet <laughs> heaven. Uh, good. Yeah. I mean, it's all good. The frustration, the impatience, the feather bed, all of it. It's all just is. And uh, the experience of, you know, pleasure and displeasure. I mean, it's nice when meditation is filled with pleasure, but it's, I remember when I came back from my, I had did a three-week retreat in a cabin at Taramandala this summer. And I said to my teacher, Lama Sultram, I said, you know, it was actually more difficult than the last times, you know, my other retreats. And um, I had a lot of learning, a lot of beauty, a lot of blessings, but a lot of also, um, challenge and she's like isn't it interesting how people think that retreat is supposed to be easy <laughs> like right i do that so meditation yeah it can be tough sometimes but we're purifying really we're purifying and we're building our capacity to to be with the discomfort of life too okay anyone else It took me a really long time to settle down. And I think, um, you know, I've been meditating, but the holidays have been tumultuous. And it really, but, and I even had like a moment of like anxiety in my meditation. But by the end, I think the extra length, even though it was like, I kind of hit this like moment of like freak out. And then I let it go and I just, finally settled in and it was probably like half hour into it so the last minutes were kind of like Ooh. that's not that long i mean that's not that long you know half hour sometimes you know i don't know if you've gone on a longer retreat sometimes it'll be the first few days <laughs> and you're like, well, that that was that was like actually got worse every day for like the first by the third day right. I was, you know, <laughs> yeah. my skin, you know yeah i know the back pain gets worse <laughs> oh yeah good well you know yeah the length is a good mirror isn't it it's it's a good mirror it is good to stretch and often we don't stretch ourselves. So that's what the teacher is here for. <laughs> Make you uncomfortable. So I said to my 13 year old, he, he's not agreeing with the position that his basketball coach is putting in on the team. And I was like, you know what? I think really your, your thing now is to just trust the coach a hundred percent, you know, unless it gets abusive, but for the most part, when you have a teacher, you've got to trust them. And you, you'll get more out of it that way. There's something to learn there. And plus, he's been a coach for 25 years, longer than you've been alive. But I'm not saying that about myself necessarily, but I'm just saying that there is a, 
the quote there's a lot that we learn from our teachers especially when they push us in ways that we wouldn't push ourselves we find that we can do things that we might not want to do or think that we can do believe me i mean my teachers have really pushed me i mean there have been times when i was on the brink of blowing it all up you know because i just couldn't do it anymore but i learned a lot and i stuck with it and um, i'm happy i did yeah so good well thank you for sharing and um yeah good okay and you're welcome lucy so patience, patience is such an important teaching. It seems it's one of the six perfections, right? We've done the first two last class with Eve. The first is generosity, as Karen mentioned, which is an, an important one on um, many levels, right? Dana, uh, paramita is the generosity perfection. It's the first one. It's state of mind. And um, yes, we're supposed to do what's comfortable, but also there are teachings with Donna about actually do what's uncomfortable <laughs> with, with donations too sometimes, right? But um, that, but that's also with your time. You know, if you're volunteering, you might not be comfortable volunteering in the cold or whatever you're doing. But you know, that's an act of generosity of of going a bit beyond the comfort zone um, when we can. I'm not saying all the time, right? Of course, we have to take take our health and well-being into account and our resources. So that's Donna. And then the next one is the uh, discipline, which um, Eve talked about as well, which is kind of like what we did, our discipline. We stretched our discipline a little bit tonight. We moved into um, more capacity with a little longer sit. And um, and it it's, can be rewarding. Um, yeah, and purifying. And then we come to the third paramita, which is the paramita of uh, patience. And that is a um, very close one to my heart because one of my main Tibetan mentors, he's my not just my Tibetan language teacher, but also like a teacher of mine, a mentor. His name was Kuno, Kuno La, or Ngawang Tundup Narkyad, which is harder for Westerners to say. So he said, just call me Kuno. It was his nickname. He died a few years ago at the age of 88. Uh, amazing human being, Kunola. My he was my grandfather, really, my Tibetan Popola. We call call them in grandfathers in Tibetan. So I honor him. And he taught me the phrase uh, that patience is the essence of Dharma. He really, really felt that I was impatient, <laughs> and would tell me, Chandra, you need to slow down, be more mindful, don't rush. And Zupa Chuki Ningbo Yin, he'd always say to me, Zupa Chuki Ningbo Yin, which is patience is the essence of Dharma. And I'd be like, no, the essence of Dharma isn't patience. It's, it's like enlightenment. <laughs> Let's go. He's like, calm down. Uh, patience. And let me tell you why. So all these teachings were reminding me of him. And there's some really beautiful stuff in there. Um, and so I want to touch on a few of the highlights for me in this chapter. So I'm, I'm looking at the pages in between 112 and 119 in the book called On the Path to Enlightenment. This is our book for the, the time being, filled with so much wisdom and beauty and challenge. Um, and there's this beautiful... Kind of a, like a commentary on patience on page 113 by Kangyur Rinpoche, who I met, by the way. I met him in Dharamsala. He was a wonderful Nyingma Lama. Uh, he probably is no longer alive, but he was, uh, he had like the bottle cap, thick glasses. <laughs> you know, you'd look at him and his eyes were bulging because they were so thick, his glasses, but a beautiful teacher. He's like one of the only Nyingma. Lamas and Dharamsala. Dharamsala is mainly a Gelukpa uh, place, you know, lots of Gelukpa monasteries, and um, uh, which is more of the Dalai Lama's lineage. Um, and I was raised in the Nyingma Kagyu tradition. Uh, but apart from the small Nyingma nunnery called Shuksa Anigompa that I, 
I actually taught English at for a while there. There was no real Rinpoche, like Lama, in, in holding down the Dzogchen, the Nyingma teachings, apart from Kangyo Rinpoche. Beautiful teacher. And so he talks about how he gives a classic teaching. So I want to touch on this. I almost thought I would draw a picture, but I think I can describe it and it will be less distracting. His image here at the top of 113, where he says, patience is essentially the ability to bear with suffering. I mean, that's, that's it in a nutshell, right? But then he goes on to say, it is the fertile soil in which the flowers of Dharma um, can grow and spread their perfume of good qualities. And what he says is essentially, in other words, the three disciplines, and these are the th or the three trainings. This is very important for us as Dharma students to know some of these key points here. So I want to um, say a little, yeah. So essentially the, the image that he's drawing here is that patience is like the fence around these precious flowers that we want to water and grow and cultivate. And so by having the quality of patience around that, then those can be nourished and not trampled by such emotions like anger and neg negative things, negative thoughts, deeds, and so on. And, um, and so when someone says in Dharma, and this goes for all the lineages, where it's, whether it's Theravada all the way up through Mahayana or Vajrayana, Tantric Buddhism, the three trainings are very important and they are key to to the buddha's path and so i want to just touch on those really quick so the three trainings are moral conduct or ethics which is shila the second is samadhi or meditation concentration and with this quality of samadhi or meditative concentration the mind can then attain more clear vision or insight right vipassana so that leads us to the third training, which is pragya or prajna wisdom. And that is that insight, the vipassana, that insight that sees into the, the way, the way things are, the nature of reality, ultimate reality and ultimate truth. And so these three trainings are basically like a condensed version. If you were to Kind of the accordion were to open, you would find the eightfold path squeezed into the three trainings. So within the first one, moral conduct, sometimes called virtue, shila, S-H-I-L-A, you have the first three of the eightfold path, right speech, right action, and right livelihood. So these are what we do, what we say, the way we earn our living, right speech, right action right livelihood so that's how we cultivate virtue you know being in right meaning aligned with um you know harmon harmonious way of being recognizing the interconnectedness of all things so not doing harm speaking kind words and having a form of livelihood that doesn't do harm then the samadhi part of the three training has three aspects to it as well which are um, uh, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And so that is having to do with how we concentrate the mind, how we, how we work with things, how we work with the mind. And then the last one is right view. And that has to do with, with wisdom. And then right intention, the eighth is right intention. So the, those qualities of right view, right intention, the last of the two eightfold path have to do with wisdom. And that is understanding the four noble truths, right? Suffering exists. What is the cause of suffering? That's ignorance and clinging, that there's a way out, the fourth, the third, I mean, and then the fourth is the eightfold path, which is what I just listed. So understanding that, Understanding emptiness, interdependence, these are all right view. And then, of course, the intention behind what we do and say is another part of wisdom in this threefold expression of the trainings. So that's what he's talking about in terms of dharma. Like, what do you practice when you practice dharma? The three trainings. What are those? 
Shila, Samadhi, Prajna. Well, what are those? Those are how we categorize the Eightfold Noble Path. Basic Dharma, that's why I just took five minutes to talk about it, even though you might be going like, what does this have to do with patience? <laughs> well, what it has to do with patience is what Kangya Rinpoche says at the top of 113 is that patience is the fertile soil. So it's the soil in which the flowers of Dharma can grow and spread their perfume. And then he says, surrounding those flowers of shila, samadhi, prajna, the Dharma practice, are these protective fence of three specific kinds of patience. So I like natural metaphor. I like images. It helps me remember things. That's why I thought this was so cool, the way he described this. And so I want to just touch on the what these three forms of patience are. Because I really feel like these are opportunities to give you classic Dharma, right? I mean, of course, we have to interpret it, bring it alive, apply it to our modern day life. But I feel like we would do you a disservice if we don't give you like authentic dharma like what what the what this the way that the great teachers have taught dharma for millennia you know who am i to push that aside so there are three three parts three aspects of patience and they all have uh, something to, sh to teach us of course so patience is the first is patience to bear suffering on the path to enlightenment um so that's like sitting for 10 more minutes being irritated with it being you know tired the achy back um getting fed up with yourself i mean all the i'm speaking from first person experience <laughs> you know those are hardships that we bear but we keep coming back because we know it's good for us right so that's a quality of patience. And that's exactly what the person said who wrote in about feeling frustrated as well. Wow, patience really was helpful with this. It's definitely a theme. That patience with ourselves, with our mind, with our monkey mind, with those reruns that go round and round, with the kids stomping around or being loud on Zoom or whatever upstairs. I mean, like, there's no shortage of opportunities to practice patience, right? And so seeing circumstances as opportunities, as teachers, is a very profound transmutation of the raw material of our life. And that's lojong, right? We've talked a lot about that in our lojong classes, where we take life as path. Path is our life. That everything is the fertile ground for awakening, especially our enemies, especially our you know, prickly parts that cause us, poke us and cause us discomfort. Those are the great teachers and opportunities to practice patience. The second kind of, you know, fence pole of the three that surround these beautiful flowers of the three training is similar, but it has to do more with being patient or having patience towards or having patience to bear the injuries that others inflict upon us, criticism, challenges, um, heartbreak, um, confusion, teachers pushing us to our edge, to our limit, or like in my kid's, kid's situation, you know, putting him as the point guard instead of the center forward or what I can never remember who, what, what is what, but like, Okay, so what can you learn from that challenge? You might disagree, but what is the learning in there, right? So in a way, it's like seeing the people and the circumstances as a mirror. And uh, in a sense that empowers us to take more agency in our life and stop blaming the world, right? Stop blaming others for our suffering. What can I learn from that annoying coach? How can I be patient with this? And then the third is um, interesting. It's sort of what I talked uh, touched on in terms of the guided meditation. So it's patience to confront without apprehension 
the doctrine of emptiness and other profound teachings. It's actually what, in terms of right uh, view and right intention, the wisdom part. So like, this is so interesting because I've seen this in modern times, but in, in Tibetan lore and Buddhist lore, there, there are stories of people, kings. Anything I was thinking. Well, I just got scared. What happened? Did somebody unmute themselves? <laughs> just like <laughs> made me pop out of my seat. It's good to make the setting so that people can't uh, unmute themselves. Uh, just because, you know, you never know what's going to happen. I've had funny things happen. Like somebody didn't know they were suddenly unmuted and they're cursing and yelling at their husband. And we'll all have to listen to that. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not that we want to control you or, or silence you, but it's just for the collective maybe nervous system. Uh, so in any case, all good. We're still here. And where was I in my thinking process? Right. So when we hear teachings on emptiness, it can be scary. And sometimes people run for the hills. They're like, I'm out of here. This is scary. Or if we have a, an experience of like the ego dissolution, it can be frightening if we're not kind of prepared for it or haven't had the growth. Yeah, have had a teacher guide us through it in an effective way. Um, and even if we have had a teacher guide us in an effective way, it could still be terrifying. <laughs> and that's okay. No shame. But um, what this is saying is this third form of patience is so interesting because like without apprehension, so like having some guts here, move towards lean in to the doctrine of emptiness, interdependence, like you don't exist. How does that feel? <laughs> and other profound teachings, you know, I mean, we're all here at studying Buddhism. And in case you didn't know, Buddha said you don't exist. So, you know, if that's scary, lean into it, try it on a little bit. Like, okay, so what does that mean? That means I don't exist in the way that I think I exist. You know, it doesn't mean that you're hallucinating and I'm not really here. You know, we're all hallucinating together, actually. <laughs> and we have this collective karmic hallucination right now, actually. And it's called consensual reality. And it's because we're born in these bodies in this eon and this earth, you know, we all experience, you know, for the most part, unless we're colorblind or something like that, like my sweater is green. Consensual <laughs> um, reality, that's a Buddhist thing. They talk about that. But in a way, this is also a dream, and it's this, it's a mental construct. But so the self, what the Buddha found on his enlightenment is that the self actually doesn't exist in the way that we, uh, in a sense, it's like our biology is wired to think that we're really these solid separate selves for survival, procreation. But under deeper analysis, uh, we don't exist as independent separate selves there is no chandra mini me in my brain right here or in my heart or in my gut i am a confluence of many different aspects so i arise but i will also dissolve back into the elements when my body dies but what does exist now the buddha kind of didn't answer these questions but later buddhists did is that there is consciousness and that is undying that is that is the only thing that's permanent, which is consciousness beyond birth and death. So that's the whole philosophical contentions, depending on what school you belong to. Do you believe in, in that or not? But I think that the more than getting bogged down in philosophical platitudes is experience. So through contemplation, through meditation, we find that we, that it's in fact, is true that our assumptions or the mental constructs around the small sense of uh, around the ego i say the small self but not like in a derogatory way but it is like small compared to big self consciousness self with a capital s right the small sense of self isn't actually really a thing it's just sort of like a hardened shell that creates this temporary feeling of separation but when that shell cracks and dissolves we just we realize that the space inside the shell and outside the shell isn't different. So, 
home. So if we can have that experience, then why be afraid, right? There's, there's nothing to be afraid of. But sometimes the biology clings, oh, we don't want to die. Or the ego is like, I don't want to die. But that's because we haven't really tasted yet how blissful the death is. So some a friend of mine just asked me, you know, Sometimes people, when they meditate, they have scary experiences or they get a little out of whack energetically or they can't sleep or meditation isn't all love and light. You know, I mean, it can bring up some stuff. It can bring up weird dreams. That doesn't mean you're meditating wrong. It actually med means you're meditating right. Usually it's you're dredging up the psyche. Your, your, your mind is off gassing and it's not always pretty, right? So all sorts of experiences will happen. Now, hopefully you have a guide you can talk to if it goes really off the rails, because you do need help. You know, you do need help to talk to somebody if, if something starts to really become an issue. But um, this third quality of patience is about that um, without apprehension, moving into those scary places. Like, okay, what is the teaching on non-self? Oh, that's frightening, but I'm going to have the fortitude and the patience to stay with it and see if there's some value there for me and if it can help and if it makes sense. So that's that third, third kind. So read that little set. It's like two and a half pages by Kangya Rinpoche. He, he talks about some other really cool stuff, but I want to go right to... Um, kind of the heart of the matter, which is actually a bit of a passage that I read to you during the meditation. He says he's talking about um, the third aspect here of patience, of, of really experientially understanding emptiness. Uh, when one tries to trace a design on water, this is the bottom of 114, when one tries to trace a design on water, the pattern dissolves in the very instant of its drawing. In the same way, as soon as the violence of hostile thought is allowed to subside, for it is incapable of remaining on its own, unsupported by other factors. You know what those other factors are? Clinging, right? So if we're not clinging, it can't, the anger and violent mental states can't really perpetuate. So he's saying that as soon as those thoughts are allowed to subside, a totally pure and spacious state of mind appears. The primordial great emptiness free from concepts. To preserve this state of openness, this simple presence, in which there is nothing to be lost or gained, accepted or rejected, without being distracted by other things, is called on the most profound path of the Madhyamaka. That's the middle way. It's called the purification of negative emotions in ultimate reality. So they just dissolve back into the space from which they came, ultimate reality. And that is a purifying process. It's like a just a releasing. The clinging dissolves. The, the trace, the pattern you've traced on the mind is uh, dissolves back into the space of the mind. Yeah. You know, these other natural metaphors of like thoughts are like uh, birds flying through sky. They, they appear, but they don't change the sky. They don't leave a line or a pattern in the sky. So like that, when we understand thoughts like that, it's very liberating. We, um, the bonds, the bondage of mental afflictions, hatred, anger, fear, grasping, jealousy, pride, arrogance. We just see that those are like tracings on the water. Sure, we can analyze and do therapy around the stuff. That's good too. But then also at a certain point, it's like we need to 
balance that inquiry, that self improvement with realizing that it, none of it really has intrinsic existence. So, Vipa Chuki Ningbo Yin. Vipa is, is patience. Zipa, zip. It's V O with an umlaut with a D, but it's like quiet D, like Zud. Zud. Zipa is the noun of patience. Chuki, Chu is Dharma. Chu means Dharma. Ki is of, Yin is. is. Zupa Chuki, Ningpo, Ningpo is the next word, essence. Yin is, is, so in Tibetan it's a little backwards, but basically we translate it, patience is the essence of Dharma. So then on the bottom of 115, we have this great famous passage from the Bodhisattva Way of Life by Shantideva, which I know Eve taught a couple years ago in this class. And it's really one of the greatest chapters of, of, of the book, in my opinion, uh, my humble opinion. Um, he says at the bottom of 115, harmful beings are everywhere, like space itself. Impossible it is that all should be suppressed. But let this angry mind alone be overthrown. And it's as though all foes had been subdued. This is the great quote here. To cover all the earth with sheets of leather, where could such amounts of skin be found? But with the leather soles of just my shoes, it is as though I cover all the earth. I just love that. I remember the first time I heard that. It was like, right. Yeah, so I will do that. I will write write that in a moment. Thank you. All the good works gathered in a thousand ages, such as deeds of generosity and stuff and offerings to the blissful ones, like Buddhas, the Buddha, the enlightened ones, a single flash of anger shatters them. This is classic teaching. It's terrifying to me that this could actually be true. <laughs> Oh my God. Oh, all the times I've gotten angry, angry at my kids. Um, but they do, I mean, anger, what I do understand this to be like is anger, when we feel angry, it's like poison. It's poisonous for us and those around us. And so it's true, we are hurting ourselves when we feel. So if we can curb that as much as possible, it's better for our hormones, for our nervous system, for our, our whole system, right? And those around us. So whether or not this shatters all the good things you've ever done, I don't know. I don't want to go there. It could, but I don't think it has to be that way, right? But it does poison us. And so, you know, for those of us who are getting, you know, maybe over 40, we also have to think, and then getting older, you know, a few gray hairs, we may also be thinking about how do I best conserve my energy <laughs> and my life force? Well, the least anger we can have, the better for our life force, right? So also be selfish about it. Be selfish about it. I'm not going to waste my chi. <laughs> on you. <laughs> so I used to say to my husband, I'm not going to get angry anymore. <laughs> I'm just not. <laughs> I've got a heart there coming from somebody. It's true, isn't it? It's like, I just can't spend that currency anymore. So I'm not gonna. Okay, so um, he says, no evil is there similar to anger. No austerity to be compared with patience. Steep yourself, therefore, in patience in various ways insistently. 
Those tormented by the pain of anger never know tranquility of mind. Strangers they will be to every pleasure. They will neither sleep nor feel secure. And then here's another classic teaching. This is a good one to teach your kids if you're raising children and everybody around you too. If there's a remedy when trouble strikes, what reason is there for dejection? And if there is no help for it, what use is there in being glum? So I've heard this translated in different ways and then I've paraphrased it over the years for my kids and the way I paraphrase it is, if there's a solution to the problem, what's the use in worrying about it? If there's not a solution to the problem, what's the use in worrying about it? You know, like, don't worry, be happy. Basically, that could be the summary. So I am not angry with my bile and other humors, fertile source of pain and suffering. Why then take offense at living beings? They too are impelled by circumstance. Although it is their sticks that hurt me, I am angry at the ones who wield them, striking me. But they in turn are driven by their hatred. Therefore, with their hatred, I should take offense. It's interesting how he's kind of dancing around or almost like, um, um, what is the sword? Uh, fencing with the the object or the target of our anger which you know we we think it's the person but he's saying well it's the stick yes it's the person wielding the stick but the person wielding the stick is actually controlled by their anger so i should be angry at their anger <laughs> or not take offense with the actual person so like a treasure found at home that i have gained without fatigue my enemies are helpers in my bodhisattva work, and therefore they should be a joy to me. That's so fun, especially in this time of COVID, because, you know, we don't, we're not going anywhere, really. We're at home, and we have this treasure here at home that we can unearth without much effort, without fatigue, meaning that all of these great opportunities are all around us. We don't have to go far or get in an airplane or travel somewhere to find it. We don't have to go to India. <laughs> Asia, we don't have to go off to Asia to get enlightened. We can get enlightened in the home, this treasure that we can gain without fatigue, which is my enemies. They are all helpers in my bodhisattva work and not necessarily always enemies, but those who challenge me, like the kids, <laughs> like the partners, like the dogs, like the neighbors. Um they are my helpers in my bodhisattva work, and therefore they should be a joy to me. So that flips all of this habitual thinking on its head. Like instead of being angry at your so-called enemies or the people who are challenging you, can you flip it and see them as a source of joy because you get to practice patience with them? You know, those Lojong practitioners in our group who've been in this class for, you know, a while now, this is this is familiar to you, and it's, it's quite profound. Uh, since I have grown in patience, thanks to them, to them it's, it's first fruits I should give. For, all my pa for, for of my patience, they have been the cause. So basically he's saying, now I'm dedicating the merit, the good energy, the fruit of my practice to those so-called enemies, because they were so helpful on my path. Oh, money put me here. <laughs> that is some deep stuff, right? So we get to chew on that for a week and put it into practice or for our whole life. But until we come together again next week, I believe it will be with Eve. Uh, think about that. See if you can put put uh, put the put your um, money where your mouth is, or pedal to the metal, or whatever the phrase is that's wanting to come here. This is where the rubber hits the road. <laughs> um, see if it, if you can put it into practice and uh, transmute the anger into patience. And I will type in the 
even when we're meditating like oh my god this thinking mind i'm so annoyed with it i hate it well can we turn it and say thank you you're an opportunity to practice patience and to practice letting go Okay, so that's Zipa Chuki Ningpo Yin. Uh, Zipa means patience. I'll just translate it. It's the essence of Dharma. Kunola was my teacher who taught me that. I remember him writing it in a beautiful Tibetan calligraphy. I had it on a very beautiful piece of paper. I wish I had framed it. So. Thank you, everyone. I hope that you felt nourished by that and that this helps you be a better person out there in the world and help make the world a better place. Because if, you know, that's why we're here and why I'm here. Thank you so much. I dedicate the merit for the benefit of all, especially to our challenging people and beings in our lives. May they heal, right? May they heal from maybe the negative ways that cause so much suffering, right? So it's not that we're trying to help people perpetuate bad things by dedicating to bad people. We're dedicating to bad so-called challenging people so that they heal and stop being so challenging, right? <laughs> That's colloquial Buddhist speak. There's the, the Donna info. Thank you again for your generosity. Give what you can give. We really rely on it now, especially we have this place that we were paying for. So we value whatever you can give, whatever it is, it, it adds up. So be well, everybody. Take care. I'll probably see you in a couple weeks. Great. I'm glad you enjoyed that, Lindsay. Great. Bye, everybody. You can unmute.